welcome back to another episode of The Property Nerds. And uh, I'm here with co-host Jack from Four Acre Financial. And I'm your co-host Arjun Polywell from Investigate Buyers Agency. And today, since it's the second episode now with Jack on board, we're doing a financed themed session. So Jack, you have this saying, What's it, how's it go again? It's around property is a game of uh, finance. finance. You, you do it better than me. What is it? What is it? <laughs> property is a game of finance. And, and by the way, you should start introducing me as Jack Forica, aka White Egg. Yeah. Surely. So for those who are in the <laughs> studio, um, the property nerds have two eggs with glasses and the two buck teeth coming out as well to show our, uh, our nerdiness. Although Jack's teeth is far better than mine. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's a brown egg on there. There's a white egg on there. I'm the brown egg. He's the white egg. So here we are. Property what a coincidence. Nerds. What a coincidence. But mate, um, this is uh, truly a game of finance because property investing how many people are out there like buying everything with cash? Like, yeah, yeah I'm sure cash deals exist, but not that many, right? There's not yeah. that many. So um, finance plays a huge part. If you're a first time investor, you're scaling a portfolio, needing to get finance right. And it's important that on this show, we cover that because for all the property nerds out there who tune into our data, the white papers, the blogs, like that all gives you insights into markets, cycles, selection. But to buy it, you still got to take out a loan. You still got to get your strategy right in finance. Yeah. I am keen to unpack three things today that you've got. You shared with me before this episode, they're gold. Yeah. And we'll unpack three different finance strategies to consider or finance policies to consider. Yeah. And you're going to get a lot more of that tuning into the property nerds moving forward. It won't be my boring voice and just start alone. We're going to go through finance policies, the real yeah. stuff today. Yeah. So stick around to the end because um, number three, love that one. So well, let's go to number one first. You know what? Number one, I'm going to make that the most impactful one. Oh, here we go. Hey, giveaways are from yeah, the start. Not me. Cause you know, <laughs> people might miss out. They might have to get out of their car and, you know, so the first one is going to be the best one. All but, right, you know, everyone's it. going to be valuable, but Love the it. first one is my, mo is the, my favorite because right now with interest rates high, you know, most properties that you buy, especially if you're cash flowing it with an equity loan from an owner occupied property or another investment property, you're at 100% LVR or 105% LVR in a lot of cases. Could you break that down a little bit for someone who doesn't know what yeah. cash out LVR stuff is? Yeah. So say you, you've got a, a house that you live in that's worth a million dollars, right? Yeah. And your loan amount on that property is 500K. So if you were to access up to 80% of that value, you can get a loan of 800K. So yeah, got it. the difference between 800 and 500 is 300. Um, that's the simplest way to do it. So that 300K would be an equity release cash out loan. Okay. Now, Obviously, it's a loan, like you're using equity, but it is a loan. So you're going to have to make repayments on that. So if most situations are like that, whether it's your owner occupied property or an investment property, and if you're financing an investment property like that and you're using an equity loan, making repayments on that, it's going to be negatively geared. And, and it'll be a fair bit, right? Because it's like course. you've got an 80% loan yep. for the new purchase you're making, and you've now got the 20% loan that yep. came from the first property, and plus you've got costs for stamp duty, yeah. buyer's agents and stuff. Yeah, and, and obviously it's worth it with the capital growth, like yeah. you're, you're building wealth, but a lot of people get scared off by, or, or they try to chase yields because of that and, and they sacrifice capital growth. But a lot of people get scared off by the repayments and how negative it's gonna be. So this little trick, right? And, and using that same example, if you've got a property for a million, you owe 500,000, you do an equity loan of 300,000, which mm. is up to 80% of a one mil valuation. Yeah. Out of that 300,000, right? And, and this is where from a broker, what you need is someone who can strategize, right? Because not all lenders are gonna give you that 300K out yeah. un uncontrolled. A lot, of, a lot of lenders would want that 300K to be controlled by them. It's like the and old ATMs, right? You go in, you have cash in your bank, but they're like daily limit, 2,000, yeah, 1,000. Yeah. That's Sorry, it. Man. That's it. So they're not just going to give you that in your account uncontrolled, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to want to say, all right, where's the contract for, for what you're buying? Um, are you able to service that remaining loan with us? If not, we can't give you the cash, right? Little, little mm -hmm. things like that. So firstly, you're going to need a lender who's going to give you the cash out without any questions. You, yeah. Well, obviously you tell them what it's for, but they're quite happy for you to go and get the lending elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of cases with the major banks, you would, you would do your equity releases. And then, you know, if, if you needed to, you can do it with non-banks or second or third tiers for the purchase. Now, out of that 300K, if you get it uncontrolled, you don't have to use the full 300K as a deposit. Right. Right. You could say, for example, just use 200K, still borrow the 80% against the investment property and have that 100K remaining as a buffer of what you didn't use. Now, if that's sitting in an offset account against the cash out loan, 
and it's making repayments on on the cash out loan mm. as well as making repayments on the investment loan that you've just taken out and receiving the rental income from that property that 100k obviously it's going to be negative geared right so the rent's not going to cover the repayments on the cash out loan as well as the investment loan yeah but as it's negatively geared it, it's it's basically de depleting that 100k but 100 might slowly come down mate, right 3 4 years mm. it'll take and as that money in that offset account is depleting, the extra interest that's charged is tax deductible against the property you're buying. Right. See, that's a good thing. So A, there's tax deductibility when your accountant obviously yeah. reviews that and confirms, right? Yeah. But the B part is there's buffer for three to four years. Yeah. And, you know, none of this involved your own cash. Like no. your own cash is on the side. Yeah, you're in a still separate servicing the, four, the 500K loan, the owner-occupied yeah. loan, right? So your cash out is not only servicing your new debt, receiving rental income and, you know, making repairs, doing renovations, whatever, right? But the, the key is that how how important are yields in that scenario when you've, you're have you still for three to four years only making repayments on a 500K loan, right? And in mm -hmm. that time, you've got rental yields going up. You've got your own personal growth and income, you know, increasing the amount of income you earn. And after that time, right, in all that three years, you're servicing your 500K loan you're building up more and more cash buffers from your own income against that loan. You're paying down that loan, right? And, you know, with interest rates coming down and all that, you can refinance it all to a better lender and, and clean it up and go again using the same method. So that's really powerful, man, because what you've huge. done just there is unlocked something called investor mindset. Mm. I think what many people get wrong as well is they buy a property, they use every bit of cash they have. And then as a result of using that cash, they're left in a position where repairs sting them. Mm -hmm. They question the property because their mindset's like, oh, you know, I don't like this and I yeah. don't like that. I yeah. feel like this isn't right. They hesitate to make future investment decisions because something went slightly odd or didn't go perfect in the first. Mm. And then because of that, they think they need to take way longer to save and they delay their second. This is proper opportunity. Or they cost. panic sell, mm. which is even worse. Because you, you paid stamp duty on the way in and capital gains tax on the way out. It's a nightmare. So that's big. And you know, like I actually personally did that myself. Like we took out 600K in equity for buying. We used 400 of that for buying. We kept 200 in buffers. Yeah. So immediately my mindset as an investor is going, I understand the numbers aren't perfect because in today's interest rate yeah. environment, nothing is. Even slap on a 6% rental unit at a cash flow sheet, it still doesn't yeah. cover it all. But then with that buffer, I'm like, I'm focused on the wealth building part. Exactly. I'm looking at my portfolio. It's like, okay, X million to X million, long-term compounding, charted out. Yep. My buffer's there. Wow, I diversified across this many states. Like that's critical. So point one, very, very important. Equity loans to help you not only buy, but deliver a buffer so you're in a better financial position yeah. and actually structuring savings as well. Like imagine that, using the equity in your, your home or investment property to cash flow and control an asset and have it not affect your cash flow position at all for three years. Yeah. It's really powerful, man. And yeah. and you'll be surprised how many people don't know about it. Yeah, because people go, oh, we only want 100K because that 100K yeah. is only what we exactly. want for this home. And then you're like, well, you've just used the 100K and now you have no other buffers left. I'll be very surprised if most people listening to this ever ever heard that before because you'd have to pay someone a lot of money for them to tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think it's, it's going to be a common theme on this podcast that we just give it all away for free. <laughs> Absolutely. That's how we roll. So that's number one. You weren't lying when you it's said, the best hey, one. that's the best it's one. It's the best one. There's some other number yeah, two. There's some good stuff that people need to know about. A, a misconception of, um, you know, bank lender policies when mm. you've just started a new job or you, you know, you're starting a new industry or you're transitioning to a new job in the same industry. A lot of people don't know that we, we spoke about it on the previous podcast that the major lenders are trying to take back the market share from non-major lenders, right? Yeah. So they there's lenders who will take your, they won't even need your first pay slip. They'll take a contract, wow. right? You, so you've got a job, you've got a signed contract, no worries, we'll use that income. That's a big change because in the past it used to be what, six months sometimes? Yeah, I mean, yeah, six months was pretty much the benchmark, mm. but uh, most lenders would you know, if you've been working in a job for 12 months or whatever, and then you transition to a new role that's in a different company, but the same same industry or same sort of role, a lot of lenders would have appetite for that. But yeah. even if you've just started a brand new industry, brand new job, you know, and you've, you've got a big pay rise or a bit of a pay cut, the main thing is you can use that income to, to assist your borrowing power. And it's not like you're scraping at the bottom of the barrel either. Like, these are big lenders that you would go to anyway for for really good, uh, really good 
loans. So, and we've seen in building a portfolio, like time and speed is everything. Yeah. Right. If you go, I have to delay my portfolio scaling from six to 12 months, yeah. or you move and you go, now I'm looking at this policy. I'm like, I could get it done in one month. It's all opportunity cost, man. Yeah. Massive. And, and you know, sometimes people have their contracts, start dates, take a time or yeah. pay slips, take time to generate. Cause if you have someone who has a contract, even one pay slips another 30 days potentially. Yeah. Right. Because they might be like going, Hey, I'm a monthly pay cycle. Yeah. So like it could be one in previous years, six in previous mm. years, 12 months, but now you're like able to get off running as soon as you secure the job. Yeah. But not only that, like we've, sometimes you have people that are in a finance clause and they say, look, I've got this job offer and oh, yeah. I, I don't want to take it because <coughs> I'm worried about the finance. It's like, no, nah, mate, it's all good. So mm. it's either the same industry or, you know, there's other lender options that are just as good. And, you know, it's, it's all transparent. There's no, there's no guesswork. Yeah. That'd be big because people then like could maybe lose that job. Delay a job opportunity. Yeah, Imagine man. that. Like Imagine someone calls me, Hey, Arj, um, I don't know if I can start. Maybe I'm not sure if we can make this happen yeah, now. Yeah. Like you obviously go like about how long and they might go, oh, it could be months. I'm not yeah. sure. Cause I have to wait for this and wait for that. And like your team might really need someone. Right. Mm. So sometimes for the right person, you go, whatever I'll wait. Right. That's right. That's key. Um, but, that's interesting because I used to always think back in the day, I was like, oh yeah, wait for six months and we'll catch up yeah. again soon. Now it's like, nah, we can yeah. change that. That's right. So that's number two, Jack. What's number three you've got? Yeah, so the, at this point, it's probably the worst kept secret. A lot of people know now that there's a streamlined refinance option am amongst a lot of the major banks, second tier lenders as well. Basically, when you have a, a loan and you're trying to refinance it, the lenders are gonna look at the actual rate with a 3% buffer. That's, that's pretty well known. Um, what a streamlined refinance option is, is that if you've got good credit, good repayment history, um, and the, the product that you would refinance to is better, you could do it on a 1% assessment rate rather than a 3% assessment rate. So basically it's really good because lenders, you know, if they're looking at, you've got a low 6% rate, they're looking at you, your ability to service it on a low 9%. Mm. Whereas with the streamlined refinance options that are out there, it's low sevens, which is, you know, much more reasonable and see this is like common sense returning yeah. to the banking world because common sense used to like not exist there right uh, maybe in some parts it still i think doesn't. it's more <laughs> around greed and market share yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't give them that much credit that they're <laughs> actually being, trying I'm to being help too people nice, no. right? i'm being too nice um no you're definitely getting the market share comment right but you know if someone's paying their mortgage they're showing yeah. you that they're paying it for six 12 months it's like why should we ping them even more with a three mm. percent buffer to go look i get you're paying your seven percent rate but we're going to make it look like you're on 10% yeah. and you can't service it. Yeah. What you're saying is like, hey, look, 1% in case it even goes up. Yeah. But like, look, I'm of the opinion that the buffer rate we have today is still too high. We yeah. already know we're at the peak of interest yeah. rate cycles. We know where we're heading. The data shows inflation's coming off heaps. We're probably too late in terms of like the interest rates. We should probably decrease them sooner. Think, and here we are mm. going, oh, we'll still buffer you at 1% above 7%, even though we know we're not going to be there next year. I think it's good. I think if they change the buffer, they would have to change a lot of other things because mm. there's things like property investment expense or just expenses in general, they're quite lenient on. Yeah. Whereas, you know, on the assessment rate, that that's a metric that they've used and it works, like people aren't defaulting. I think if they True. loosen that, it would just get too out of hand. But True. then again, you look at some non-major banks, they don't have any assessment rate. So you know, it's happening out there, right? It is, yeah. but a lot of people, most people don't go there. Only like really aggressive people would go to a, a third tier lender that has zero assessment rate and they'll take actual repayments on interest only, existing interest only loans. So it, it's still out there, but for the major ones, I think, you know, what they're doing, it's it's working, but yeah. Could you expand on the actual interest rate only thing? Because yeah. people might not know that what that means or how mm. that works. So well, you've got to, we've got to explain what an interest only loan is. So yeah. when you get a loan, just an, just an average owner occupied loan over 30 years, it's principal and interest, right? Yeah. Now, when you get an interest only loan, generally it's for use for investment properties. You would have a 30 year loan term, but for the first five years, you'd only be paying interest. And after that interest only period, you'll be paying principal and interest over 25 years, which because you haven't paid any principal in the first five years, it's gonna be a higher repayment, right? And the major lenders, they're looking at your ability to make it on the 25 year loan term, which is the higher so they're repayment. they're pinging you for five years yeah, and going- With a 3% buffer. Right. Right, so if you get, if you have a portfolio, which most people do when they have a portfolio and they've got interest only loans on their existing portfolio and they're tapped out with the major banks, right? If you can get hold of a deposit, you could look at a lender who will look at the interest only repayment, 
and and take that with no buffer at all, no three mm. percent buffer. Don't worry about when it rolls over to interest uh, rolls over to P and I. They're just looking at the actual interest only rate. So what's the repayment today? That's a little <clears throat> yeah, bit. and it opens up so much lending. Like I've seen you help people get an extra property or two under that, and then you've used that first strategy, which is the equity pool. They've put that in the buffer. So it's like they've gone to their yeah, main banks to pull right. the equity, put that in buffer for their purchasing. So they're well yeah. cashed up now. Then they've gone to the smaller bank to add that extra one to two purchases. Yeah. And all of a sudden they can still handle it all because they've got that extra capacity and buffer sitting there. But they only had that option because they had the equity, had the capital. And that's, that's right. why the capital growth strategy is just so much better because when you have capital and you have the equity available, you have those types of options. So it doesn't matter that 80% of your your loans are with major banks and then just a small loan against one investment property is with a non-bank lender because they're the only ones who will give you the money. That's right. But if you've had the capital and you can cash flow that asset, it doesn't affect your cash flow. Mm. But you only had that option because you had the capital growth. So That's the core foundation everyone yeah. should get out of it from a property side. So, mate, three big takeouts there. First one is unlocking equity to build a buffer and build a actual like holding strategy for the next mm. few years as finances get reviewed and strategies are there, um, preserving your cash for even more buffer on top and saving more cash that way. Then the second one is we unpacked um, the pay slips, right? And just how people could have early on job contracts, yeah. pay slips yeah. initially yeah. get going. Even in probation. Probation period, yeah. right? That's key. And then the third one is being able to refinance but not be stuck. So mortgage prison, right? Remember that was a big term going mm. around. People were like, man, who comes up with these words? Someone's a brilliant like mortgage prison, just so yeah. ruthless. It sounds, people weren't in mortgage prison because you're able to A, refinance them yeah. without the 3% buffers. They can bring it down to 1% buffers. Man, we had some nightmare scenarios where people pre-COVID or during COVID got loans with a you know lender that you've never heard of before mm. and then they had rate cut off uh, rate increase after increase after increase and they couldn't refinance they're making repayments struggling but yeah, couldn't tough. refinance but yeah. and and it's weird because you you look at a client who is making repayments on an eight percent mortgage owner occupied eight percent mortgage yeah but they've, they've got clear repayment history and no one's going to take them on it just doesn't make sense it's so, also kind of like the people paying rent today, right? Yeah. How many how many people pay rent more than their, more than their mortgages? Yeah. And they're like, I'm paying this rent, but you won't give me a mortgage payment loan. Mm. So, mm. yeah. Well, made um, three core helpful tips. I love uh, you know this episode is pretty cool because. I've been, last few episodes, I've been lonely, right? I've been, I've been by myself just talking about some data I've got, research I've got, yeah. but you've right, bought in the finance stuff and this is truly going to help people Many more to come, mate. Expand. We haven't even spoken about trust yet. Yeah. Mate. Yeah. Yeah. Big. So guys, um, if you've been tuning in, three core finance strategies here. Jack, how do people get in touch with you to un unpack these finance, but more of a tailored scenario? Yeah. yeah. Well, get onto Google, Forecker Financial, uh, we'll put the link in the description as well, but yeah. yeah, very easy to find me if you're looking. Perfect. Jack Foraker, mate, thank you for another episode on The Property Nerds. This one, uh, definitely appreciated you holding the mic for this one because you crushed it with some epic tips. And finance, or property, no, sorry, property is a game of finance. Love it, love it. So I think that there's a longer version of that quote, right? Property is a game of finance with a bunch of houses thrown around. Isn't that, <laughs> yeah, isn't that yeah, what yeah, it is? Yeah. I wonder if we can extend that quote even more. Like, property is a game of finance. We're going to get a whiteboard up here. <laughs> we'll brainstorm with a bunch of houses around that outperform the market. Boom, yeah, yeah, there, there you go. go. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, got it, man. So um, that's another episode, Property Nerds. Thank you for liking, subscribing, all the following. And uh, we are also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, crossing over half a million downloads, which is pretty, pretty cool. So guys, thank you're welcome, you. Mate. You're welcome, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. <laughs> Episode two, he's claiming it already. Uh, is this what you do in the footy fields, by the way? Yeah, like yeah. get one trying, like, hey, boys, it couldn't happen without me. Um, but look, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for your love uh, and, and likes and subscribes here. We got much more gold coming your way. And uh, this is just episode two with the new duo in town, property, finance coming together. Um, and we've got some more data, more white papers. And speaking of white papers, last episode, we did a white paper episode on 10 cities that will actually improve a lot in their performance as interest rates come down and change their overvalued undervalue ratios. Go and check that out. It's investorkit.com.au and click on property research. And hearing this all, if all the finance situations that you've had or are in now and that something's clicked today, whether it's the new job scenario, whether it's um, being on you know the probation, as Jack mentioned, or whether it's uh, having refinancing in the bank that you're with is saying, you know, we can't make better interest rates and you've spoken to someone else and they can't refinance you. 
Um, or even just looking at it from how do you invest without being cash strapped if you've got the equity and, and building a good founda foundation for your house, um, reach out to Jack at foracrefinancial.com.au and no doubt his team will help. Catch you soon. Game over.